Hello everyone, welcome back to the Christ Motor GP podcast and after a pretty frenetic weekend in Indonesia, Jorge Martins championship lead has shrank but he is the Grand Prix winner for the first time since Le Mans in May. It was a, a chaotic weekend gents, there's plenty to talk about uh, in the title fight and, and further down the grid, we've got Stewart's decisions also to discuss again but I suppose Lewis we'll start with the the main crux of this it'll be the title fight between what seems like a two horse race now between Bagnaya and Martin Martin making the big blunder on Saturday in the sprint that looked like it was all there for him and Bagnaya took advantage of that but then in the Grand Prix Martin made it pretty clear that he was the man to beat in Mandalika yeah, uh, uh, and I, I would, I would actually argue controversially, um, which I know is a bit early in the episode to be doing that, but it's, it's probably looking like a one-horse race realistically. Yeah, there was a crash in the sprint, but like you look at you look at Martin's form through that whole Grand Prix and the Grand Prix weekend in general, he was perfect pretty much apart from the sprint race. Had he, had he seen that one through, you know, we'd be talk, we it would be kind of a different complexion altogether. Bagnaya just was not on pace at all this weekend yes he won the sprint he wasn't going to win against martin had martin stayed mounted and we, we he we saw anyway in practice that he was good on the soft tires it was the medium tires for race pace that were bag now struggled and that proved to be the case in the grand prix and it just follows on from the, the kind of the consistency we've seen from martin yes he's only that's only his third grand prix win but he's just been steadily mounting up those second places podiums good results you know and comparing his kind of form Across the season versus Pecos, it's way more consistent. And we're now in this phase of the season where Martin just is so strong. We go to Japan, we know what he did there last year. You know, we, with Phillip Island, he was on for winning that Grand Prix despite going a different way with the tyre. A mistake he won't make again. We're, we're, we're just at this point now where, yeah, the, the momentum's with Martin. He's got the experience of knowing how to fight for a championship. And I think kind of getting through Indonesia after the crashes, you know, he talked about he had ghosts in his head, you yeah. know, of, of the things that happened before. The fact he got through that and in quite a dominant way as well, I think is a kind of another hurdle there for for Martin. I think, that, I think we will now see a stronger Jorge for the rest of the season. Yeah. Pete, what was your take on his weekend? It was, um, how can I say... The championship is strange because he technically lost three points, but he was the dominant force, especially in qualifying. It was a ridiculous lap he put in like straight away, and it just he didn't really need to do a second run because his advantage was that big. And the mistake in the sprint, it, it probably like Lewis mentioned, he had ghosts from the Grand Prix. He probably thought this is not happening again, surely. But it was a, a dominant performance, really, wasn't it? It, it was, and as you guys say, I mean, the mistake in the sprint was really a get out of jail card for Pekka, wasn't it? Because he, he was, he, he was, his back was against the wall a bit. As Lewis said, the pace looked like he was in Martin's side all weekend. And so that, that is going to grate with Martin a little bit, but he didn't, you know, give the double blow, if you like, as far as getting, you know, both wins in both out the way. But, uh, you know, as you say, a lot of ghosts put to rest, a lot of revenge, uh, you, you know, on the Sunday. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the question now, I suppose, is if, if we are talking about Martin as the title favourite, there is pressure that comes with that. And he's done a very good job, isn't he, of saying, look, I'm a satellite rider. It's not my job to win the World Championship. No one's ever done it. And so it will be inter interesting to see. He's got a lot more experience, as Lewis has said, but now he's in that position. He, the end is almost in sight and he does have a significant points lead. What will that do, you know, as far as making decisions for races and will he ride a bit tight, everything else? But, uh, you know, on Peko's side, he can't afford another weekend like this where he doesn't have that pace. We've seen quite a lot of the time that they've been pretty equal, haven't we? Where they go into a race and really it's that first lap that almost decides which of them wins. Um, on this occasion, it just looked like Martin had something extra. We've seen that with Peko earlier earlier in the year. There's been some events where it's just been, look, you've got to just finish second if you're away, Martin, and take the points. Um, and this was, you know, the momentum of the seesaw went the other way. So, uh, yeah, you know, a bit of a glass half full, I suppose, for both of them. They're both going to leave. Uh, as you say, Jordan, Pekka will think, well, hang on, I'm three points closer than I was at the start of the weekend. On the other hand, the momentum, yeah, thing, yeah with Martin, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And, and Lewis, I wanted to say about Bagnaia's comments after the sprint, where he mm. said the it's a, a championship of mistakes. Why, why is that? Just for our listeners, just to... It's it's obviously to do they think it's with the tires this year and the way it's the characteristic of the GP twenty four. Carry on to explain just for our listeners. 
Yeah, yeah. It's it. There's. I mean, it was funny because both Peko and Martin kind of had their own schools of thoughts as to 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 what the reason was. Generally, though, we've seen this year. You know, we we think back to Silverstone when Peko crashed again. The same kind of comment came up. These 2024 rear tires from Mitchell are are really really good. They're really really grippy. It's the reason why we're seeing all these lap records absolutely demolished week to week to week. I don't think there's been a Grand Prix weekend that's gone by where the lap record in qualifying hasn't gone. The grip that. there is so good, but because you've got so much grip on the rear, it kind of pushes the, the, the kind of the limit of grip you have on the front. So you're pushing into corners, you're charging into corners. There's there is a there is a tipping point where the the front is just a bit too overloaded, and and that does seem to be what we've seen this year in terms of why we've had these mistakes. I, I think um, the the GP24 especially, you know, really really uses uses that rear grip well. Um, and it's improved its braking a little bit. I think, you know, we remember last year with the GP23, there was this all oh, lot of comments of the rear pushing the front, and it's why Bastianini struggled so much. Yeah. Um, and if you look this year, it's why Betzeki had such a really difficult first, you know, half of the season, really 10, 12 races, really, until Bez kind of fi- figured things out. So there's this kind of, yeah, w- th- this probably is the, the main issue. You know, others have said, well, you know, two guys on the edge, on the limit, there's going to be crashes. Uh, Marquez made a good point of that if you look four or five years ago, six years ago in the championship, you you, you didn't see that same kind of thing in, in the champ. You know, you remember we was we spoke about this in our, our work chats and um, on the weekend. You think back to two thousand seventeen. You think back to Mark and Dovey, those two having a real proper head to head ding dong scraps. They weren't crashing. You know, there wasn't. You know, one of them wasn't choking and throwing it down the road. So I don't necessarily think it's a pressure thing as such. I think yeah, the the, the tire has a lot to to. to to take there and and, and Peko also said um, with the GP24 it's kind of a, a thing that if you're in front in a race you can kind of manage the, mm-hmm. the, the, the the rear takes a little bit of time to come up you can manage that rear grip more with the front if you're in a pack you're going to struggle more because you can't then compensate for a lack of grip to begin with to then so then that's again another reason why we maybe see see these crashes as well so yeah I think the tyres do have a lot to kind of blame but <laughs> You know, Peko seven DNFs this year, five DNFs or non scores the year before, five non scores the year before. Yeah. That that's not. You, I don't think you could fully chalk that down to. A you know, it was just more grip from the tires. There's clearly a pattern of mistakes between you know, for, from Peko certainly, and and from from Martin a bit less so. But there there is this pattern of mistakes here. Yeah. Pete, anything you want to add to that? You know, well covered, Lewis. There, I think it pretty much sums it up this year. Did, did I sound like I knew what I was talking about for, for a change? <laughs> you said, it was covered perfectly. Man. I think I think the listeners will really appreciate that. <laughs> so they will. Uh, Pete, anything to add to it? I think it's uh, it, it's frustrating as fans. I think they want to see the two and the top of the championship really fight, and we're not really getting it, are we? No, no, we're not. And uh, you know, you. As Lewis said, it's hard to see any sort of pattern towards these crashes. You know, sometimes they happen, as we saw with Martin, at the start of the race. Sometimes they happen at the end of the race. Sometimes they happen in the middle of the race. So you've got, you know, it's not just a new tyre thing, an old tyre thing, a fuel load. The, 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 it sort of it changes all the time. There's no real pattern to to when there's there's this danger zone, if you like, for these two guys. But, um, you know, yeah, to combine the two title rivals, as you say, you look at, what, 12, 13 accidents or something this year. It's uh, it's quite incredible, really. I mean, uh, coming to Martin's specifically, his accident in the sprint, we know that the sort of the first laps, as we said before, they're almost like the last laps in the, fa- in the past. The races are won in the first lap. So you can understand why yeah. he was pushing that hard. On the other hand, as we've said, he did have a pace advantage. And I think... You know, maybe that's also where the team that they, they need to come up with a sort of a, a fixed strategy almost to say to the riders before the race. You know, this is what we'll do. If you're leading after lap one, you know, just don't push it too hard because you've got the pace. Um, especially with Pekka, what was he fourth on the grid? So there's a decent chance mm-hmm. that you, you know, you're not going to have Pekka breathing down your rear wheel. Pekka was in second, but there was there was a bit of a gap there, wasn't it? Of course, Martin can't see behind him, so he doesn't know exactly how close he is. But uh, yeah, I think maybe as we look to these last six races and the championship. But maybe there just needs to be a bit more of a strategy as far as when to when to twist and when to hold, if you like, when to take the risks, especially if you're Martin, because, yeah, you know, that was a, well, as we've all said, it looked like a pretty easy 12 points thrown away there. Yeah, it did. Uh, Lewis, what about the the mentality that Paco Bagnaia has? Now, like, he has closed the gap in theory, but 
it seems like he's further away because he he had the issue again the Grand Prix with the start and he mentioned that Ducati need to get on top of this. It's just little things with Bagnaia that seem to set his weekend completely in a different direction to Martin this year. Uh, yeah, I, I totally, I know I know 100% what you mean. It does sort of feel like, yeah, we've had this kind of turn and fraud over the past couple of weeks in terms of where the championship gap has been, but it doesn't quite ever seem like Peck has been, so it doesn't really seem like Peck has been the guy in, in command. You know, you think Emilia Romagna, it was Martin's mistake really that kind of, you know, put him, shrunk that gap, and and same in, in the San Marino Grand Prix as well. It was a mistake in the sprint race for for Martin again that closed that gap. I th- I think Peko's mentality. Yes, we've had these start issues, but none of the other GP twenty fours really seem to be having it. You know, we saw Martin starts of the weekend, and they were absolutely dynamite. I mean, nobody was getting near him into turn one. But, you know, Peko was the inconsistency. The start and sprint was great. The start of the Grand Prix wasn't. Bastianini kind of, you know, it doesn't really seem to have those problems either. It's it's a tricky one. It's almost as if Peko's maybe a bit too sensitive to, you know, it's almost like Maverick. You know, Maverick's, uh, you know, we talk about Maverick when he's, you know, when everything's perfect and you're not going to see which way he goes. But whenever yeah. anything's just a little bit off kilter, Maverick doesn't quite seem able to surmount it with his riding talent and I kind of think that might be true of Peko as well at this point that when things aren't quite right Peko I I don't know I I don't know if it's a confidence thing or if he just he's yeah he's just not as adaptable as as maybe Martin is Um, because we, we you know he Martin said in the racing there was quite a lot of wind into to turn 16 and he was like it was really really upsetting me so I just thought, okay, I'm going to ride this corner like I was on a scooter and then I'll be quick in every other part of the track. You know, that's that's how I'll make up for that. And I, I don't know, it seems like Martin to me is just a bit more adaptable on the fly compared to Peko, where it's a bit like, you know, Friday was a disaster on the medium tyre. He puts a soft tyre on and he's like, oh, everything was fine. Yeah. And it's like, okay. But you, you're everything being fine on what you need to just kind of, there's an element where you need to ride around some of those issues you need to push through it a bit more and yeah it was it wasn't just the start for Peko as well really in the Grand Prix you look at the it was the first six laps were really a killer for him and Bastianini yeah you know his pace I did a bit of maths again which is never is always bulletproof but it does at least give us a little bit of an insight into <laughs> how things have panned out first six laps uh Bastianini uh Peko was half a second well Per, you know, average slower than, than Martin was in that phase of the Grand Prix and, and Bastianin was about the same and that's some of that's down to maybe tyre warm up as, as we mentioned earlier but like mm-hmm. you know when you, you, you're giving away that amount of time to, to Martin to allow him to build a gap you know we saw when Bastianini finally broke away he was two and a half seconds behind Martin a gap that was never going to close yeah you know I think this is the thing is that there's Martin just seems a little bit more like he's able to ride around these things and get the most out of of the package whereas Peko maybe just relies a bit too much on everything all the feelings everything being in order yeah I think there's um there's a lot of this year I've noticed it a lot more but Martin last year for example I think of little things maybe annoyed him in terms of well, not not little but obviously the, the the Qatar stuff with the tyre and I was like well he seemed to me he was pretty defeated by that and then in Valencia he was very scrappy uh, it, it was very on the edge in the Grand Prix but this year it seems that he's been able to just kind of mentality wise just completely get rid of any sort of negativity even after that uh, Bastianini incident we had at Mizano it was so I was like really impressed at how sort of bulletproof he was in that he said yeah of course I'm annoyed by it and but he says for next time I know it's going to happen it was kind of almost like a just a real shift in how I thought about the championship this year between the Bagnaia and Martin especially I think he this weekend the mistake happened I thought oh, we're going to get another one of those weekends, but he, he completely, after Saturday, even with the words that Bagnaia had said about, uh, he thought he was going to run wide and he thought he was never going to make the corner, Martin kind of said, well, I'll I'll make sure to kind of correct that tomorrow. And he went and obviously, I think he beat Bagnaia by, what, five plus seconds. So I think it shows that he's, yeah, he's really switched his mentality. And Pete, how, how do you think for obviously mentality in this championship we'll, we'll move to the third and fourth 
Hanea Bashnini and Mark Marquez, their their weekend was yeah, it was good on the Saturday, but Sunday was just one of those title changing days for them. You know, Mark having a an engine failure caught fire. Anea was the fastest guy on track and then crashed out of third place. A, a real damaging weekend for them. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And uh, yeah, you know, I suppose to start with the big blow for Mark qualifying those two crashes again. What is it with him in Q2 at the moment or qualifying? I mean, starting 12 on the grid, it's the last <laughs> thing he needed, isn't it? As you say, the great ride in the sprint, that great first lap. Um, but he's the first to admit you can't do that every time. You can't rely on, well, I'm going to make up you know, seven, eight places on the first lap. Um, but uh, as you say, with Bastianini, he was fast all weekend, wasn't he? Uh, he probably, you know, yep. all things being equal, he would have provided Martin's closest sort of challenger in terms of, of pace if he'd have started with him, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, there we are. We see in the race, as Lewis says, suffers at the start. Then he's making that big comeback and, and down he goes. And uh, yeah, for the championship, uh, yeah, disaster really for both of them. Um, I, I think if you're looking at the, the sort of the biggest losers for the weekend, it was those two, wasn't it? If the if the title guys both sort of came out of it with a draw between them, it was those two guys that lost out because what is what, 75, 76 points that they need to make up. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's there's really six races left. It's it's not, not enough time really. And uh, you saw Bastianini head in hands in the pits. And Marquez, I think he said he was he was sad, wasn't he? He was saying that uh, you know pretty much his chances have gone. So, you know, you know that they, they, they can still fight for race wins, and obviously they will. They'll be free of that sort of championship battle, if you like, from their minds. But uh, yeah, certainly I think it's a it's a two horse race. Uh, you know, from now on, um, uh, he had the damage to the to the bike as well. That's the other thing for Mark, isn't it? Now, um, it, I think he made the comment about the fire extinguishers, which I've, I've never heard a rider say that before. So, yeah. if that is true, and it wasn't maybe the, the the right fire extinguishers or the latest kind to deal with those sort of fires, then obviously that's needs to be, something that needs to be looked at for later. But uh, yeah, yeah, big uh, big blow for them and and the Grassini team. You, you know, you saw it again when the cameras panned back, back to the pits. Frankie Carcetti. You could see how uh, how distraught he was at seeing uh, Mark go out like that. So there we are. Um, let's face it; they'll they'll fight between between them for third place now, won't they? So there's there's two sort of title fights yeah. going on there, and uh, we'll see who wins that. Yeah, as Pete mentioned, uh, Lewis Marquez made an incredible start on Saturday in the sprint. I mean, he took seven places in the turf one, which was just ridiculous, and he um he looked really good on Saturday, and I think near the end of the sprint you've kind of seen the gp24 have his real strengths over that 23 especially with him and anaya anaya was so quick at the end obviously but you've seen it it was evident that he was struggling in certain areas bash nearly, nearly caught by now that was like a tenth of the line obviously peckle rolled out a bit but bash weekend like you've mentioned earlier if he just had it started a bit better and didn't have to get through on more Delhi and that really just cost him because I thought it was probably his best weekend so far this season from practice to, to races. Yeah, I mean, Bastianini, on those two laps he was trying to pass Morbidelli, it was like seven tenths and four tenths slower than, than the lap before he'd kind of got onto the back of Morbidelli and that's such a huge amount of time to be losing when you've got, you know, three seconds to close down to the leader. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Bastianini's pace from Friday was fantastic. It was on the level of Martin. And it really was looking like it was going to be those two because, yeah, Peko and none of the other Ducatis were kind of up there. Um, qualifying, I think, let him down there. I think front row, things might have been different for Bastianini. But, yeah, uh, the problem is, is we, you know, we kind of talked about Bastianini coming into this form now. <laughs> Where was it at the start of the season? That's, yeah. that's, that's the issue here, really, is that Bastianini kind of took too long to really get going you know, for to, to, to be a realistic title contender. Um, and same with Mark as well, although there was not really an expectation that he was going to... It was one of those things where we thought, well, if he gets everything right, you know, there's a very good chance you fight for the championship because it's Mark Marquez. But the step between the GP23 and the GP24 has been a lot bigger than anyone has expected, no matter what the factory riders say. The factory riders are lying about that because I, I think Ben Zeki summed up really well is that the the GP twenty three has a bit a little a little bit more entry grip, but yep. like the, the traction of the GP twenty uh, the traction of the GP twenty three is a little bit better as well. But once the tires wear, that's where the GP twenty four really comes into zone because it can just turn on a dime. So 
I think this year we kind of saw saw that, and Peko said as well when he was racing Bez and racing Morbidelli, it was a bit more difficult with Bez because it was like, well, I the GP23 has a couple of strengths over us, whereas with Morbidelli, I know exactly exactly what yeah. the bike's doing. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's yeah, it, it's unfortunate for both for both Ine and, and Mark, and you know, Mark's a tricky one because like. The engine fails. So you can't really. You can't. It's not his fault. But before that point, he was seventh. You know, and he's got better pace. He's got podium pace. He's better pace than that than seventh. So the qualifying is a big letdown. I think I, I kind of gave him quite a poor rating in the rider ratings yesterday on Crash Talk. Now because of these qualifying crashes, you know, he speaks about oh well, you know, even I'd started higher, third was my maximum. I'm sorry, Mark. That's kind of a bit crap you're mark marquez you could definitely get if you're in the hunt you you are you've got a much better chance than you know just what you you claim to be the limitations of your bike so yeah yeah the, the saturday thing really is the focus for mark now over the next few rounds you know not need to worry he's won his races he's done that get saturday fixed and you know look yeah. ahead to next year as he said i think in the press conference on thursday objectives for the scenes are complete so in theory, he can just go out and enjoy himself now. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he goes in Japan and Philip Island. I've I've marked him down for a few wins there, mm. so I think uh, it'll be interesting. And also, the first time I've heard Mark Marquez actually swear in a a TV interview properly, which was quite funny because he did mention this, as you say, get yeah, Q two is the nightmare for him at the moment. And yeah, I can tell us it's annoying him because he he does have really good pace and he does have when he qualifies well. He does usually qualify on the front row, so yeah, a, a, a weekend really just ugh. unfortunate circumstances for Marquez. But we'll talk about P two, Pete and Pedro Acosta having a a fantastic ride on the gas gas at the KTM, and we we were left waiting for a few hours to find out if it was <laughs> going to be confirmed or not. As it came up straight after the race, it was a tire pressure infringement, and usually when that comes up. Most of the time, that means they're going to get a penalty. But in this case, Acosta kept this P2 due to a leaking uh, wheel rim. So a good result for him, but that was a, a long wait with the stewards, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, as you say, we'll get into that. But yeah, for Acosta, yeah, great, great weekend, really. I think, um, you know, back up there, top KTM, um, and, and taking the fight to the Ducatis, which is uh, what what's you know what he wants to do. Um, let's see if they can carry on with this, build some momentum. There's, there's, there's so much that seems to be going on at KTM at the moment, doesn't it, with new team managers and everything else that we'll get on to. So, yeah, he's, yeah. he's providing, you know, it's not been a, a, you know, the season of the KTM, not the season that they hope for. Let's see if they can make a strong finish to it. And uh, it looks like Acosta, well, Acosta and Binder in the championship are very close, but certainly this weekend Acosta was a step ahead, wasn't he? And Binder, okay, lots of bad luck in the sprint uh, with various things. But I think in the race, he, you know, Binder said he just didn't have the pace. His pace was pretty much sort of linear throughout the race and it just wasn't enough. Um, so, yeah, but with the cost of, what was he, a second and a half behind Martin? I mean, that's, you know, over 27 laps. That's, that's, that's really close and uh, a great ride from him. So, yeah, you know, let's see what he can do in, uh, in the rounds coming up. Yeah, and I will say, just to add, that, like the funniest clip I've seen this year, if you haven't seen it, go on uh, any social media platform, it'll be on there. So in the cool down room, they handed Pedro Acosta a bottle of, I think it was Coca-Cola. And it, obviously he was uh, very thirsty. And he uh, just decided to keep drinking it. And he was just burping a few times throughout it. It was one of the funniest things ever. And I think that uh, actually Dorna have edited it out of some other clips, which I find like... Keep it in there. It's a bit of it was funny, so it was yeah, but a bit of amusement after. And Lewis, the stewards thing we'll get on to now. Oh, it was just a long wait for it, wasn't it? It was like we we got the Acosta stuff, and then we get told that the Nakagami and Binder stuff would be decided at the next race. So we didn't have an official classification of results, and then they changed that again. They released the, what the reason was behind Nakagami and Binder. Just a bit of a mess, wasn't it? We, we were... uh, yeah, I'll, oh, I'll, oh, I'll try and keep this as, <laughs> as yeah, I'll try and keep this as clean as possible. Uh, it's it it makes MotoGP look stupid. It makes yeah. this, it makes this championship look really really dumb. This was a bad rule to begin with. We've been speaking about it for a while because of you know 
But how how do you possibly manage tire pressures when you've got all the right height devices and aerodynamics and stuff? And if it all hinges on where you qualify, but if you somehow jump ten bikes in front of you, then your tire pressure set wrong. So then you're going to get a penalty. But you know, it's really stupid. Uh, the, the there's there's I suppose there's two elements to this. There's the stewards element and there's the Michelin element. And I'll we'll tackle the Michelin element first of all. This kind of is an avoidable issue. The 2025 front tire was was meant to kind of really address all this and make you know, and it's not going to be introduced next year because they couldn't get the teams to agree to any testing time, which is. Is just ridiculous. I'm sorry. I know it's a busy calendar. I know, you know, OT costs money. Oh, we need to keep the manufacturers happy, you know, which is, I think, kind of nonsense. Ducati's not going to leave the championship if it's forced to test some tyres every every now and again, let's be honest. This was an avoidable situation going forward, and the teams have kind of cut their nose off to spite their face because they didn't want to do the testing. So MotoGP's got to take that one on the chin and the teams have got to take that one on the chin regardless of whether they think it's a good rule or not. The stewards element is ridiculous as well. You know, we, we have this automated system to check the tyre pressures and yes, once the, the system is flagged, they have to go down and check it properly, check the data properly. But, you know, it cannot take until after a press conference and after a podium and after, we're talking to a rider who might not even be there. That's That, yeah. that cannot be the case. We, we've seen this before and we've spoken about this before, you know, after Jerez, for example, you know, that horrible, horrible situation of Danny Pedrosa getting a sprint podium in the paddock when, you know, because Quattraro got a penalty. That's just rubbish. It just that is not a great look for a championship that just... And and the expl- we'd got no explanation from, from the stewards, from Dorner, despite, you know, we, we probed, we asked them, you know, what what was what was the delay, first of all? And then, you know, why did they all of a sudden decide that they were going to delay it until Mategi for a result and then, yep. you know, decide, oh, well, actually, we figured it out. And the only answer we got is, oh, well, it took less time than they thought it, w- it would. Okay, but how long did they think it was going to take in the first place? And secondly... Isn't that the steward's job to investigate incidents to the end, not to be like, oh well, we'll we'll, we'll take care of it next week. That's we we don't get to finish our work early just because you know, uh, well, we thought this would take longer, so we'll do it tomorrow. That's not how life yeah. works. So that situation is not very good, and it just again we've come from another weekend instead of talking really about the racing, talking about the stewards, talking about the lack of transparency, talking about the lack of you know kind of consistency that they just total nonsense kind of regulations that we have when it comes to tyre pressures. And yeah, I just, I think it's just overall made MotoGP look weak. I think it makes the, us, the media, look a bit stupid because we're sitting here going, oh, you should watch MotoGP, it's great. But then you've yeah. got a situation like this where it's like, oh, there's a tyre pressure rule. It'll take a few hours to figure it out and who knows. And also the thing about the wheel rim is exposed a bit of tolerance in, in the regulation because... If if that's all it takes, and uh, you know, surely then uh, teams are going to be just a little bit less careful when they're you know with the wheel rims in the pits. You know, if, if a little bit of damage, that's all it's going to take for there to be yeah. to get away with the regulation. Uh, it's just it's rubbish, and there's just not enough transparency on how they work it out, how the system actually works, because we don't really know. We know that they have you know it's automated, but we don't really know the ins and outs of it and the the fact of the matter is is that freddie spencer has never at once in in his entire tenure as chief steward bothered to come and speak to the media or do anything to explain the decision and that's that's your issue if if you were if i was dorna and you've got so many people in the media chat going this is rubbish what's the explanation we need to know and they don't have an answer for it surely you would go this look makes us look really bad we need to fix this and yeah. That's the situation we're at. We seem to have a stewards panel that has no transparency and a championship that doesn't really seem to care one way or the other. And now we end, yeah, we end up in this stupid situation where we're talking about tire pressures and lack of transparency and and the stewards not being very good again. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, it's just, <laughs> I, I just, I don't want to come across as just so negative because I, I, I vented a lot of anger in my house yesterday uh, <laughs> while waiting for a decision. I was just sitting uh, I won't say what I was saying to, to my uh, computer screen but I was just getting so annoyed. The fact that it took so long for a decision and Pete 
it's just not a great look, as Lewis says, is it? It just seems so unprofessional and just lack of communication is really bad at the minute. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a feeling of dread, isn't there, when that ticker comes across the screen at the end of the race and we know it's going to be for a tyre pressure and it's, who's it going to be? Um, and, and as you quite rightly say, Jordan, you know, normally when, when someone's named on that, that's it. They they do get the penalty, don't they? Um, not on this case. Uh, but yet, so basically we had three riders investigated and three different outcomes, uh, which again was a new one. So we had, uh, you know, we had the, the, the yeah. real rim, as, as Lewis mentioned. We had Binder, who was just found when it was checked not to be in breach. And then Nakagami was. Um, we, we weren't told why Binder, when it was checked, wasn't found uh you know, sort of guilty. It seems like it was something to do with the sensors that uh, were sending the real time stuff, mm -hmm. maybe didn't send the right data. So then when they checked it against what the team had, the team, you know, could show it was over. But, uh, but, you know, for me, it, it, it just has the feeling of a, of a rule that's been des designed by a committee. You know what I mean? It's the, all the percentages and it's trying to keep so many people happy yeah. and it just ends up with getting so overcomplicated if you just look at Nakagami, he was, what, five seconds behind, I think it was Ralph Fernandez, five seconds in front of Rins. So quite clearly, you know, he was in clear air, and that's why he was under pressure. But he was in clear air because nine riders failed to finish the race. Now, how could exactly. this team possibly, how could LCR possibly have sat there before the race and gone, right, you know, bear in mind he finished, I think, you know, right in the wheel tracks of Alicia Spargo the day before. How could they possibly predict that kind of race? And then you get punished for it. Um, and then that's without going into the issues that we've seen with Mark Marquez, where he got pushed wide at Assen by, by another rider. You then slow down. You, you lose tyre performance, which again, this is what Nakagami, because we think they have readings on the dash. Let's, let's just go back a bit, don't we? Certainly the Ducati riders do. Yep. So it tells them, look, you're going to be in danger here. You're not going to make the 60% of the laps we saw mark we saw did you ass and then start playing around but they had riders next to them so they just you know pulled to one side quickly ducked back in nakagami would have had to give up five seconds to fall behind alex rins by then he'd have been even more under pressure so so there's really you know he's really it's it's out of his control and it's out of the team's control um and and that's without everything that that uh, you guys have, have already gone over as far as the decision making and everything else and and the last thing i'll just say on this from my point is we're all just fearing aren't we that this is going to affect a race winner it's bad enough that potentially a podium but a race winner yeah and the title and let's remember if acosta had have dropped uh you know the 16 seconds peco gains four points so it, it would exactly. it doesn't just mean the two guys that are fighting for the title are at risk here it's anyone that's in between them as well could influence the points uh, yeah and and the championship thing is a good example. I remember Valencia last year. Coming into that weekend, the two, Beko and Martin, had used their, their jokers as it was before they got a penalty. And we were all sat there thinking, this is going to be decided by a tyre, this is going to be decided by a tyre pressure. And it was, instead of having this kind of excitement for a championship decider, we all had this fear of it being a farce. And, you know, and okay, yeah, this regulation was ostensibly brought in for safety reasons because, you know, teams had been kind of floating a grey area. And I know I know people like to, you know, the the angrier sections of the MotoGP fan base like to blame Matt Oxley for that, but it's it's, it's not his fault. He just <laughs> he just he just wrote the story. But like we we've known for years and years and years that teams have been winning on one point seven five bar a tire pressure on the front, you know, well below this one point eight minimum or one point eight eight as it was last year, which was even more ridiculous. And yes, there's a, this element of, you know, we've had more aero and stuff like that, which adds more load onto it. But if the problem with the tires is the aerodynamics, remove the aerodynamics. You know, I know, okay, well, do you need to get the manufacturer's degree, blah, 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 whatever. I'm sure that a manufacturer who doesn't agree with it right now will very much agree with it when their rider loses the championship because of a tire pressure penalty. And they'll go, oh, well, we, you know, that's the problem. The tolerance thing, as Pete mentions, is stupid as well. Because if you're in clear air, because people crashed, you're not cheating. You're not gaining an advantage because your tire pressures are, are lower than they should. And and I raised this point yesterday in, with Dorna about, you know, surely if, okay, if there's a mechanical kind of tolerance that Acosta had, surely there must be a case of like, well, we've seen eight riders crash out in front of this one person. There was virtually no way for them to increase the tire pressure. Surely that that should count for something. So why it doesn't, we, yeah, we were... it's a rule decided by a committee, a rule decided by people that don't ride MotoGP bikes. 
And it's it's almost a regulation that seems to be designed to save face for Michelin, but all it kind of does is make Michelin look like they haven't designed very good tires. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which, you know, and and I'm and that's not me having a go at Michelin, that's just what the optics of it are. Yeah, it is. And the the point you've both touched on, the, the one that annoys me is the whole, you have to predict kind of where you're going to be after a certain lap or if you make a good start or if someone crashes, if there's a big crash like yesterday, there's four people already out. How can a team think, oh yeah, this is what's going to happen. You need a crystal ball. It's it's motorbike race, it's motorsport. Uh, um, Anything can happen. It's so yeah. annoying. That's the that, point I don't like. That isn't racing. No. Guessing tire pressures to know where you might be in a race is not racing. Pure and simple. It's that's that's why we see these these first laps are so aggressive and all these crashes because the tire pressure rule makes it that this isn't racing. We're not racing no. anymore. We're just I think Martin said last weekend in Mizano, if you get qualifying right, that's eighty percent of the weekend done. This is more GP for goodness sake. This isn't you yeah. know this isn't follow the leader of Formula One. This is the best supposed to be the best racing series in the world and it's oh well if you're qualified in the front row that's 80 percent of your weekend yeah come on you know i know the bikes have got a little bit with the aero and stuff but this tire pressure rule really is a big a big hindrance it really is and that's the last i want to talk about on this episode <laughs> I, I really don't want the effect of championship like I, I just have a feeling it actually will somehow and yeah. it'll be really frustrating as fans imagine having someone be crowned world champion and then two hours later it gets taken off them or so I, I couldn't think of anything worse for uh, a world championship the peak of motorbikes to have that it's just it's just not yeah it needs to change and i don't see how and when it's going to change because we don't have new tires next year so yeah that that's all i'm going to say about that i want to get on to some better news and, and talk about <laughs> things that we have coming up and just th today we had mentioned that Aki Ayo has been officially confirmed as uh, Francesco Guadalli's replacement at KTM next year Pete B big for Acosta and Bender having worked with him in the the Ayo set up for Moto2 and Moto3 it's going to be a, a, a nice to see him in, in that role of MotoGP uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I think we were all slightly surprised when the split with Guidotti or the rumours of it first emerged. But um, yeah, we still don't know, do we, exactly what's going on there. Obviously, someone's unhappy somewhere. We don't, we don't know if it's Guidotti, you know, wanting to leave KTM, mm -hmm. wanting to find someone else. Either way, you know, he's he's going. And uh, that was confirmed Sunday, wasn't it? Straight after the race. And then here we are, Monday morning, uh, we get the uh, confirmation of Akiaya. Yeah, as you say, uh, you know, a good choice. If you're looking for a team manager at KTM, he's somebody that they know very well. A uh, bit of a reputation as he for running a tight ship. To look at the, the success he has. A tight ship and not cutting any corners either. Let, let's say that, is it? You know, the Motor 2 of the yeah. 3 team. It's, it, you know, whatever they need to perform, he gives them. And a very calm influence in the uh, in the pit box, as we see, and, and and the riders that have come through, it speaks for themselves. And I, I think you're you're right to raise, uh, you know, Binder and Acosta having raced for Akiaya, and I think especially for Acosta, this is going to be quite a big boost. You know, the guy that gave him his Grand Prix break, won those World Championships with him. We heard in the summer break, didn't we, we that he was going to see KTM because he he sort of didn't really know some of the people involved, and and saying that when he when you're in Motor right. and Motor Three, you're sort of at you know, in a different part of the factory kind of thing. Well, now he's got someone right at the heart of the MotoGP team next year that he knows really, really well. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point that you raised there about Costa. Lewis, what's your take on it? It's, uh, it's It seems logical from KTM's side to get him. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I remember speaking to, to Pitt Byer a few years ago, um, and he spoke about when KTM kind of first came into to Grand Prix, and it was obviously with Aki Ayo, and you know they would kind of working out of the back of a truck and stuff like that. And it's, you know, there's that really long-standing kind of relationship. And Aki Ayo is such an important kind of member of KTM's kind of motorsport history and Grand Prix racing because obviously he has kind of been their reference, their, their factory team for so long, as it were. Um, and obviously the turnover of top talents have come from Aki Ayo. You know, whether it's with KTM or not, but, you know, people like Marquez, people, you know, Binder, Acosta, Zarco, you know, Moto2, yeah. Oliveira, people like that. You know, there's just such a great, great hit rate of, of top, top talents. And, yeah, Aki I was going to earn his reputa reputation as a bit of a kingmaker, really. And and so, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's a shame for Guadotti. You know, he kind of stepped away from that 
Pramac stable to come to KTM and it hasn't quite worked out and it you know it it seems this kind of move is possibly part of KTM kind of really scrabbling about a bit to sort of course correct because I'd actually forgotten about this but the you know this is the eighth year of KTM's project to MotoGP and it was within eight years that Stefan Pira wanted to be fighting for the world championship in MotoGP and they have come absolutely nowhere close so it does seem that this is a bit of a part of a much deeper reset um uh, from ktm's part and yeah aki's if there's one person that's going to help steer that ship it's going to be going to be aki yeah for sure if you want to read more about it head across to christ.net got the story on there as well just a few other things to touch on 2025 calendar is out there is no triple headers but there's seven doubles it's 22 races but just to let you know a little secret i don't think it's a, 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 a real quiet secret but uh there might only be 20 races there uh, a few could drop out uh we'll cover that in another podcast uh seems to be a pretty positive change for the the calendar most of the paddock's pretty happy and yeah let's see what happens next year and while i forget just as it's on my head i've got wrote down here miguel Oliveira suffered a, a real nasty injury in friday practice and as i assume i think you'd be out for the rest of the season it's a real nasty break of i think it's the the radius bone and his right arm i think it is just a nasty crisis it was a, a glitch with the uh, i think the electronics on that track house of Prilia, and it sent him over having a high side really nasty hope miguel gets better soon but yeah a- any take on that lewis pete don't chip in on it it's a it was a real nasty sort of 500 cc crash, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's not the first time we've heard a pretty uh, technical problem before. You know, we've had a, a few of those over the years. Um, I think quite a lot last year, actually, for the RNF team. I remember Ralph there Mendes was, yeah. saying, you know, we really, really need a pretty to help us here because the bike keeps just, yeah, developing all these sorts of faults. Yeah, if there's, you know, two injuries in terms of motorcycle races that are really bad news, it's radius bones, scaffold breaks, you know, that's, you know real bad bad news for Miguel. We've got such a tightly packed kind of flyaway schedule. It is hard to see him coming back for, for the rest of the championship, really, because, yeah, uh, it's just it's too nasty an injury. And I guess he'll have one eye on next year as well with, you know, he's got to adapt to a Yamaha. He's going to want to be fit for those preseason tests. Um, so, yeah, it's a real shame for, for him and a bit worrying for a pretty that, that these kind of problems we see these problems t- tend to kind of crop up at hotter races. There's yeah. clearly a fragility with that RSGP when, when temperatures skyrocket. So, you know, hopefully that isn't the case, but there'll be one to keep an eye on over the next kind of few weeks when we get to Thailand and we go to Malaysia and places like that. Yeah, Pete, any take on it? It was it was proper nasty stuff, that crash. It was, as you say, yeah, real 500cc stuff. And... Uh... The reason for that is just like the 500s, no traction control, um, as you say. The reason behind it, we don't know. Did a sensor, as you said, did, did the heat get to a sensor or was it literally something in the you know the coding or something like that? Um, the, the slightly worrying thing, I suppose, is that we did see these reliability issues last year at RNF, but they were running year old bikes then. You know, Oliveira is on the very latest spec now. So that's going to be a bit of a concern that, um, you know, that there are potentially reliability issues on the latest spec bike going into a lot more hotter races, humid humidity as well, which, you know, is never good for electronics, is it? That sort of getting the moisture into everything. Um, again, we don't know exactly what it was, but either way, it definitely was a, a technical failure. And uh, as you say, for Miguel, yeah, he's I mean, best case really is that he comes back, I suppose, for Valencia, says says goodbye to the team and then gets to test the Yamaha two days later. Yeah. Um, but that will depend on, I think he's considering surgery, isn't he? I think he's flying back to Portugal. Um, where he'll be looked at by his doctors there and, and they'll make a decision on whether he needs surgery. So, you, you know, potentially look at the positive side, he, he should be, I suppose, depending on how the surgery goes and the, and the nature of it, fit to ride for the Yamaha, you know, make a Yamaha debut uh, at the Valencia test. I think that, as you say, that will be his priority now. We, we were... Yeah, I think it will be. And like I say, just hope he gets better. So he's had a lot of rotten luck to be honest in his time during the the Aprilia era and injuries and yeah hoping him to get back and fit as soon as possible lastly gents just the Japanese Grand Prix not going to go into too much detail uh just just to give people a weather report uh it is looking quite mixed on the Friday it looks decent Saturday looks pretty wet and then the Sunday looks dry and then it 
it might rain. So there could be some drama there in the title fight and just the overall picture. But Mategi's a, a circuit I always love. I always think of, uh, yeah, a lot of things always happen in title fights at it, I always think. We've seen titles decided there. Marquez always winning on the Honda. That always seemed to be his place where he got his world titles. The battles with Dovi. Yeah, I just think it's a great circuit. And last year was a really wet race on the Sunday. And Martin came out victorious that day. But, yeah, could, could we see... The GP24s, I said to you before, I think it'll really show here, especially with the back straights that they have at Mategi. That 24, I think, will will show its real strengths over the 23s. Lewis, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think the the, the way that the GP24 really uses a rear grip from this tyre is going to be crucial in those you know, really low-gear acceleration points. Um, the, the the thing about Mategi is obviously it's quite a fuel-thirsty circuit, so... Um, yeah. You know, that's always kind of been an element for races. <laughs> Cal Crutchlow a few years ago, he was in a podium position and he broke down in the last lap because he ran out of fuel. Um, it, it's a real problem there. Um, yeah, the, the rain is, is is always a factor. We saw Martin was brilliant at Japan last year in, in, in all conditions. So you kind of you can't really look past him to kind of go there and, and, and do the same. And I, I think it's, yeah, we're, we're now at that, this kind of important phase of the championship you know, if Martin really is the, the, the kind of the favourite now, which I think he probably is, he is in my eyes, I think now, Japan's kind of probably going to be the place where we see him stamp a bit of authority. Okay. Pete, Pete any thoughts on who you think will go in his favourite? Obviously, it'll be the Ducatis, but do you think, like Lewis says, that, that Martin will just have that little extra edge because he was so strong here last year? I, I think so, yes. And I think also if we're looking towards the mixed weather as you as you flag up there then with the points lead he's got it's really important for martin not to do what he did at Mizano. you know he, he's had that kind of warning yeah. if, if it happens again this weekend with the weather he's just got to look at what peko is doing hasn't he and um because because we could well see that situation where we get rain or we get a decision on when to pit and i think that you know they're going to have to be completely clear this is what you do, you know, in this scenario, this scenario, this scenario, as far as the weather. Um, as far as the track, yeah, stop, go, isn't it? Lots of hard braking, hard acceleration. Um, I suppose we should, a bit of a shout out for uh, Johan Zarco, you know, great ride on the weekend for Honda. Honda's yeah. home race coming up, important one, because as he says, he wants to find out if, if you know, the progress will carry across to this stop and go track, because acceleration is still their main weakness. You know, it definitely looks like they've made progress um, as far as... Uh, you know, since the new fairing, things like that. He thinks he's made progress under braking. He's still slightly concerned about the traction under acceleration. So uh, let's see this weekend. A lot of pressure on on both Japanese teams. Obviously, the the bosses will all be there, won't they? It's Honda's it's Honda's home track uh, or own track. Uh, you know, they own it. And uh, so yeah, let let's see what the Hondas and the Yamahas can do as well. But yeah, I think um, that will be interesting from their side. And and the the KTM's and the Aprilias really were looking at whether they can step it up and. Uh, sort of chip away at the at the Ducatis. But as you guys have said, it's going to be a tough task. It looks like the GP24s especially uh, should be in the class of their own. Yeah, I think so. And it all depends really on the weather because, you know, the, the Japanese weather always changes so much. And yeah, I think it'll be a, a great weekend. Just for predictions, I'll start with my first one so we can give you time to think about yours. I think for the sprint, and this is my theory, I think... I think Mark Marquez going in the sprint. I think because he, he's, he's highlighted qualifying being an issue. If it's wet, I think he's going to put it on pole and he'll win the sprint. I think Martin will be on the podium with him. Third place, I don't know if Bagnaia is going to be there. He needs to have a strong, strong weekend here to try and prove almost me wrong and how I'm thinking how this title fight's going to go. But for the Grand Prix, if it's dry, I think Martin's going to, going to win it. He was so strong in all conditions, as Lick Lewis said last year. He'll be the, the guy I think that'll... I think it'll be a pivotal weekend in this title, especially going into a one-week break. If he can win the Grand Prix, what does that do for him in the last four rounds? It'll be massive. So, well, Peter Lewis, any of you want to start with your predictions, you can you can go first. Go I'll, uh, I, 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 think it's, I, think, I think it's Martin all the way. I think Martin qualifying spread Grand Prix, I think. I, I, I think Mandalika was a really important weekend for him, crash aside in the sprint, just the way he was able to kind of that mental resilience that, that Martin's kind of shown quite a lot this year. Uh, and yeah, just the strength of, of how he was last year in Japan. I just, I can't, I, I think we're now, 
I think we're probably now going to start seeing Martin assume control, but who knows? I'm sure next week I'll probably be wrong, but <laughs> you know, we'll see. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, Martin is is looking a clear favourite, but I'll um, I'll go Pedro Costa for Sunday just to do a real shock. I, I just think he, you know he's he's great on the brakes, isn't he? Those slow corners. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just I can't. I'm looking at that race result on Sunday. One point four seconds after twenty seven laps behind Martin, and you know if he if he could do something like that, he's got the confidence now. Uh, if he can qualify well and get up there, he doesn't have to worry about the championship like the guys potentially around him. And uh, and we all know, don't we, how much KTM, or in fact any of the any of the European manufacturers, love to win in front of the uh, the, the the Japanese uh, bosses. So uh, certainly, yeah, KTM after the year they've had, let's face it, they, they've been waiting a while now, haven't they, for another win? But uh, but yeah, realistically, yeah. I I do think it'll be Martin for the double. But uh, yeah, let, let's see if someone can uh, shake things up a bit. Yeah, and like I say. 75 points for Nea Bastianini off the championship lead. 78 for Mark Marquez. Keep that in your notes. They have essentially freedom. I know they always did have it, but now they can kind of just go out there and who knows, they might even get involved. And this will be yeah a headache for Ducati management because you know, you've know you got Mark who's going to the factory team, but Nea who's leaving, who do they look at and be like, well, just try and play a bit far. But I don't think anyone will play far. This is a, a title fight that's going to go... I can swing either way just in one race so keep that in mind for this weekend if you enjoyed the podcast make sure to subscribe on YouTube leave a comment on what you thought of the weekend in Mandalika also if you're listening on Apple or Spotify leave us a 5 star review it helps it massively if you're on social media and you see anything drop us a follow we have all the latest news there especially of course on Christ.net as well I'll have to keep that plugged in there of course it's the main website so yeah If you enjoyed that, come back next week and we'll discuss the Japanese Grand Prix. Take care.